Hi everybody and welcome to Comic-Con at Home and our presentation, Christmas in July, the psychology of pop culture and Christmas. I thought we would start off by having everybody go around and maybe talk about their um, favorite or a, a one that comes to their mind that, that stays to the forefront um, of their favorite holiday memory or tradition. So let's start with Dr. Fugit. Favorite memory or tradition? Um, probably my favorite memory was going through and um, kind of unique on the on the panel, I guess. I have a kiddo. Uh, he's not much of a kiddo anymore. He's a teenager, which is you know as thrilling as you can imagine <laughs> with a teenager. But um, his first Christmas. That's I guess my happiest memory, like the first Christmas presents and the first. Christmas tree and the first Christmas ornament and all of those firsts that really made it feel like, you know, like my little family. How about you, Dr. Black? Um, I'm going to go with tradition because my family is really big on traditions at Christmas. Um, my dad insists that everybody is under one roof for Christmas Eve in particular um, because we have to get up and see what, you know, Santa's brought us Christmas morning. Um, <laughs> So I go over to my parents' house every Christmas Eve. Um, I read The Night Before Christmas with my mom, even to this day. Um, that's something mm -hmm. we do every Christmas Eve and watch It's a Wonderful Life on um, TV. So that's my, my big tradition. Good. And then let's go to our graduate students. And they both have presents because this is actually their first con experience. <laughs> and so um, we thought it would be nice for them to have a little Christmas present. Um, to go along with the con experience, but don't open it till the 25th. So, um, let's go with Casey. Um, I'll pick um, tradition. My favorite um, Christmas tradition is going to the movies on Christmas Day um, after I've already visited my family and stuff like that. It's a little relaxed way of spending the holidays, so I really enjoy it. And Jake? My favorite Christmas tradition would be every Christmas Eve, my mom pours us all a glass of top shelf tequila, <laughs> not a glass, a shot glass, so a shot of top shelf tequila, <laughs> and we all are gathered around the table in the kitchen and we take our Christmas tequila. So how long has this been a tradition? Since you were like four? or <laughs> Maybe it... just for her, but... <laughs> <laughs> She's had to deal with Jake, so... That is true. You know. That is true. Yeah. yeah. There is that. Um, but I was included around like my master's level years, just whenever the tradition was brought back. Uh -huh. I gotcha. <laughs> well, for me, um, it's always been Christmas Eve. That's been kind of more of a, a fun time and special time, I think, more than Christmas morning for our family. Um, we always had a story that was told that might not be a traditional Christmas story, but um, had something to do with the Christmas holidays and the spirit and spirituality and that sort of stuff. And we open up our stocking stuff um, on Christmas Eve, and so that's always a fun family time uh, for me. I enjoy it a lot. So, what I thought we would do is start getting into um, what it is that you're here to, to hear about. Um, and I'll have Dr. Black maybe go ahead and talk about how we ended up coming up with this project and um, where our list came from and how that kind of all came to be. I can totally do that. Um, so this actually started around Thanksgiving 2019. Um, a bunch of us found ourselves actually in Dr. Fugit April's office um, at her university and we started talking about how you know Christmas was popping up everywhere. You couldn't walk in a store without seeing Christmas decorations everywhere. Um, this was like maybe a week or two after Halloween, so we weren't even in Thanksgiving. Um, so we started looking and thinking about, you know, Christmas is so huge and such a huge part of culture. And we all could come up with these memories that we're, we kind of just did with you guys now of the movies or the traditions or something that really resonates with us for Christmas. So we started kind of joking around of what would it be like to study Christmas and what could that look like? Just remember, Dr. Beard, you quarantined so that you could do this with us. That is true. <laughs> the whole, yeah, quarantining for them to be bad grad students and break the rules. Hey, we have all been quarantining so we could be together as a family. <laughs> true, it is the Khan family. It is. And you see how well they listen to me. So as you can see, we have a lot of dialogue between us, um, and this really influenced what we did with this study. Um, so this is a study, this is a research experiment that we did where we actually looked at real data and came up with a list of Christmas movies together. Um, 
the, the, a very interesting, unique thing about this particular study is all of us contributed to creating what we wanted to study in this um, in a very cool way. You know, we had Dr. Beard who wanted to represent his Disney side, um, and we had Casey who very much That's wanted Jake. Jake. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jake. He is struggling <laughs> with his Maybe <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> Casey is struggling with. I just want to say, I quarantined for this, people. Help me. <laughs> that was so, we'll get there. So we had Casey, who very much was advocating for a Christmas cow. Oh, you know. Look at it. That's right. It's <laughs> a thing. And Jake, who had some horror and some different things he was advocating hardcore for. Um, so these different things really came across on our list. And we also started looking at the Christmas traditions. So you have, you know, the Rankin and Bass claymation that came out in the 60s that kind of continued on into um, the 70s and the 80s. The TV specials, you know, we can see everything from Supernatural, which is a powerhouse show, to um, newer ones like Schitt's Creek and everything in between, you know, and the yearly Doctor Who special that everybody sits down to watch. Mm -hmm. You see all of these classic TV shows um, new and old kind of have Christmas specials and movies and we have movies hitting theaters still we have movies on TV be it you know 24 hours of a Christmas story which really brought that to be a powerhouse classic for people um, as well as it's a wonderful life which was a box office fail and then suddenly became this huge TV hit when it's showed like I said every year on Christmas Eve or Hallmark which is its own powerhouse um, mm -hmm. we see Hallmark you know getting ready to kind of talk about and is kind of talking about Christmas in July right now themselves and showing movies in July. They showed movies at the beginning of this quarantine even to kind of keep people happy. So it's its own kind of unique powerhouse and has been since the 2000s. So you get all of these things as well as other holiday movies kind of growing in popularity and we were really curious about them. So we created this list of movies and specials and also songs. So we really wanted to look at what is it about holiday things that people love, they really like. So we kind of created this list of everything from the classic movies, the animated movies, the TV specials, the Hallmark movies, the horror movies, as well as kind of some other movies that kind of hit with different holidays. So we included ones like Eight Crazy Nights and different things to kind of represent um, as much as we could around the holidays in December. So this is something we really created together and had a lot of fun creating together and are really excited to talk about today. I'll, I'll just also add to that that we also, um, <laughs> we, we kind of went overboard. Um, everything that we do is an actual research study, so we go through our Office of Research Integrity to collect our data and to make sure everything is vetted and approved before we, you know, ever, um, our, the first participant ever sees any of our stuff. But we wanted to make sure that we had a really good list, which means we had a really long list. Yes. Um, we all had our favorites and our genres and things like that that we really wanted. But we also tried to capture sequels. Um, I don't know if that's the right way to say it because some there are prequels and then yeah. there are also some that are just, you know, straight remakes. And so we tried to capture that to see if we had some kinds of changes over time or if, you know, a particular version was more loved than the other so mm -hmm. there are i think seven or yes. eight versions of a christmas carol mm -hmm. and it depends on how you want to define a christmas carol because yep. there's muppets involved and then there's mickey mouse involved yes. and um there's the traditional so we did try to capture that kind of mm -hmm. broad spectrum the other thing is that we tried to be very careful to be as inclusive as we possibly mm -hmm. could so we were interested in um, religiosity around Christmas, but we were also interested in spirituality. So we have things on our list that are um, not Christmas movies. They represent other holidays like um, Eight Crazy Nuts. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of season, that holiday season is what we were trying to capture. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, we just tried to be as inclusive as we possibly could. Well, and that takes us to uh, the measures that we used. And one of the measures uh, that we had our participants fill out was the centrality of religion scale, which looks at religion as well as spirituality and how um, religious meaning and um, behaviors kind of shape our personality. Um, and there are five core dimensions um, that fall on that scale, including um, private and public uh, practice, uh, religious experience, ideology, those sorts of things. 
talk about fandom scales that we used. Yeah, so we've been using something called the Fandom Identity Scale, um, which really breaks down your love of fandoms, your love of shows, into these different categories. You have the enthusiastic part of it, where it is you love this thing. It is your favorite, and you enjoy it ex to an extreme degree. Um, versus the social piece. So you talk about it. You enjoy talking about it like we are doing right now um, to the internet, to your friends in real life, your family. You have conversations around your favorite show versus you're an appreciative fan, meaning the shows that you love have meaning. They have something important to you. So be it Dr. Beard with Mickey Mouse or myself with Nightmare Before Christmas, which I'm representing, whatever it is, it has a special meaning in your life and is important to you. And when you hit kind of high on all of those things, so enthusiastic, appreciative, and social, you're kind of this total fan, which I always like to look to Casey for, for this one. That's right, because, you know, in the end of all things, what we're really looking for is things like stands, too. And, you know, you can't be a Christmas stand if you don't know facts about Christmas movies. Like, did you know that Ralphie from A Christmas Story is an elf? I know you don't care, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no one cares about elf. It's like the worst Christmas movie. Not what you guys think is the worst Christmas movie, which makes me sad. But Santa here will talk about the naughty list later on and the nice list. But elf is the worst movie she really hates it <laughs> what is there to like about it really hates it <laughs> moving on let's talk about the love scale um oh. dr fugit so we use the um we've been doing this research for almost a decade now we've been into pop culture mm -hmm. research and um the scale that we usually use for love is the hedrick love scale and it has six different types of love mm -hmm. um the first type of love that we usually talk about is pragma and that's that practical, <clears throat> duty-driven, honor-bound kind of love. Um, love the one you're with kind of idea. Um, then there's ludos or ludus, and that is that playful, uncommitted, flirty type of love. Um, agape is the next type, and agape is that selfless love, and it is actually the one that's usually most associated with religiosity in terms of popular literature or... Um, you know, if you want to look at things like um, different scales in terms of religion and spirituality and in particular Christianity, it's often associated with that, probably because it is that selfless type of endorsement. We'll get to it in just a minute, but our data doesn't support that. And I, as you can see, I have in front of me all of our actual data. So um, it's a lot of fun, for me at least. But the next one we're going to talk about is mania, which is the obsessive or possessive type of love. Kind of like the love that this one feels about Mickey Mouse. Um, he's all about all about the, the, the mouse. The mouse. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jealous and extreme. <laughs> Please, like, if you ever see us out, ask him how much he loves Minnie Mouse with that yes, jealous yes, and extreme. Yes, yes, please me. ask him. Please ask him. <laughs> um, the next one is Storge, and that's how I feel about this group. As Dr. Beard has already alluded, we've kind of um, quarantined so that we can be together for this family, this family, um, the Khan family tradition in terms of being able to present for Comic Con International. And Storge is that friendship family type of love so parental love or friendship love and that's the kind of love that at least I feel for these other humans I'm supposing um, I'm hoping that that's true for all of us and the final type of love is eros and that's that traditional passionate love or romantic love that's my favorite one to talk about it's our favorite one to talk about because we're huge Yuri on Ice oh fans. my god yes <laughs> and to me I can't think about that show without thinking about that um perfect kind of romantic love how romantic everything is and so those are the different types i said earlier that when we looked at the data that in literature we typically see agape that selfless love associated with religiosity we did not actually see a correlation with our participants and their score on our religiosity spirituality scale the crs scale that um, Dr. Beer mentioned earlier, and Agape. We did see positive correlations with two measures, though. 
pragma, which is that practical kind of reason, duty bound type of love, and with eros, the passionate love. So we did see some correlations between the two um, and religiosity. It just wasn't the one that we kind of expected. And so the last scale that we used is the big five um, inventory. But before we did get into that, what did you all get for Christmas? Another box. Another box. Uh -huh. That's what you get for opening it up before December 25th. <laughs> so. <It> sucks. <laughs> I also have to ask, how much tape is on those boxes? So much tape. So much tape. So much tape. Oh. All right. The big five personality inventory, um, it looks at personality types. And actually um, measures things on five, hence why it's called the Big Five, five personality dimensions. I thought it would be kind of fun for us each to take one and to talk about um, high, and score, high and low scores um, on each of those five inventories. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with openness or open to experience. So people who score high on that, they tend to be imaginative, they like variety, independent. And those who score low on that particular scale, personality scale, tend to be more practical, kind of concrete, like routine. Um, that sort of stuff. So let's go to conscientiousness. Which I was tasked to do for some reason. Um, but uh, with this particular trait, if you're high in it, you're very reliable, very um, responsible, very self-disciplined. Whereas if you're low on it, you're more go with the flow and maybe even impulsive in nature. And then the next one is um, extroversion. That's me. So extroversion it says a lot about how you feel about being around other people. So to be high in extroversion means that you really enjoy being around others. They really fulfill you and make you feel um, energized and things like that. And if you're low, you don't quite feel as kind of at home around others. Um, you kind of get all your strength back by spending time by yourself. Like everyone in this room except Santa. <laughs> He's a little extra. If you yes. cannot tell that. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. Can the, the bells can, jingle. Can, yeah, can the microphone pick up on the jingle bells every time? He shakes his head. <laughs> he jingle. It's the most distracting. Dr. We also have it. to add that every time he shakes, I'm getting rained on by glitter. <laughs> yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> There's it's a lot great. of mistakes. It's, 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 it's but let's okay. let's talk about agreeableness, which is the next factor. I like how you said you thought it would be fun, and then you assigned us each one. My, I am agreeableness, which is what he chose, and I'm gonna read this to you because this is verbatim what he said to me. Individuals who are high on agreeableness are warm and welcoming. They're easy to talk to. They <clears throat> represent helping fields. They make you comfortable. Individuals who are low on agreeableness are, you know, you. And then he pointed to me. Me. Like, I am not agreeable. I am the most agreeable. He said, you know, uncaring and cold. She does statistics. I'm a clinician. Dr. Black is a clinician. She does statistician stuff. Yeah, why am I the only one with concrete evidence in front of me? Just <laughs> saying. <laughs> yeah. She got that one. Yeah. Again, we quarantined for this. Uh -huh. And then the last one is neuroticism, or now it's called emotional stability. Mm -hmm. And emotional stability um, is characterized by, like, if you're high in emotional stability, you, you know, go with the flow, you keep your cool, um, do well under stress and pressure. Uh, low in emotional stability is a little more neurotic, uh, like me during Christmas, whenever I have to deliver everyone's presents in one night. A um, little shaky under pressure, harder to console when you're stressed out, um, a little more sensitive to that sort of thing. So those are the different scales um, that we used uh, with our participants. And let's talk about some demographics so you all have a sense of what our um, sample was like. Before we talk about demographics, can we just appreciate that Casey is now on her third box? <laughs> I am! Because you're opening it up before December 25th, like Doesn't matter, I totally got another before Christmas Santa deck. Oh, best Christmas ever. <laughs> best non-Christmas Christmas ever. Oh my best Christmas like in July Wonderland ever. Christmas. Best Christmas in July, I really like yes. it. Yeah. So, um, our demographics, we had... Pretty standard for us with the data we've been collecting, like you said, we've been collecting data for the last decade or so. Pretty kind of standard. About 55% of our population was female, about 78% of our 
responding population, self-identified as white, about 87% identified as heterosexual, and 11% identified as LGBTQIA+, which is actually a huge uptick for us from when we started collecting data. I think that in Dr. Beard and I's first data set, um, we had something like a 4% report rate for um, that population. So we're really excited that we've been able to get more representation on that. And that's our goal is to be able to up all of our levels of um, representation so that our samples are inclusive as possible. We had representatives from Gen Y, Gen X, from Gen Z, and from um, Boomers. Um, so we kind of got the whole um, span. We had the most Gen Y. We probably think that has to do with just who's using technology, who's willing to do online surveys, things like that. Then Gen X, then Gen Z, who are just now, a lot of them turning 18 and can participate in our actual research. Um, this is a national sample, so this isn't a convenient sample from just our university. So uh, we were excited to see that kind of breadth. About 83% identified as a fan of Christmas media, which is pretty interesting to us because only about 36.8% identified as religious and then another 19.2% identified as spiritual. So just over 56%-ish identified as spiritual or religious, but 95.5% um, of our participants identified as celebrating Christmas. So even though we have a huge population of individuals who are either identified as other religion, I think that we had something like 32 different religions and forms of spirituality that people could self-identify as belonging to, including agnostic, um, non-denominational Christian, Catholic, Buddhism. Um, we also had um, agnostic different things like that so we had lots and lots of different options for people to self-identify on there with and so it was really interesting to see that we did have some that self-identified for that about 11 percent identified as agnostic for example and about six percent identified as atheist so for the fact that we have about 95.5 percent still identifying as being a fan of christmas media was really interesting um especially because we when we went into it kind of were wondering about that religiosity as a factor clearly because that's what we collected so let's get into what we found. Um, and before we do that though, um, I want to uh, let you all know, we're gonna pop up on the screen here, um, a link to a Poll Everywhere um, poll that you can take. So you can pause the video right now if you would like to kind of play along with us. Um, this is not an all-inclusive list for what we gave. Uh, we had a lot more on there, but we did take some selections from it. Um, and so if you would like to go online and um, vote, for what your favorite and least favorite um, types of things are, whether it be movies or specials or songs, um, you can take a second to do that. And let's get to our list. Go to the list, do the poll, or you'll wind up on the naughty list with me, but it's okay because I make it. Do you need me to help you there, Santa? <laughs> sure. All right. So looking at... So you're gonna do the top movies and specials first, right? Yep. We're going to the Good nice list. list. Mm -hmm. Always left at this. <laughs> All right, so the nice list. Coming in at number one, we have Home Alone. I'm Not also a fan of that one. <laughs> so good. That one is followed closely by Charlie Brown Christmas. And number three, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. That's the 1966 version, the OG Grinch, mm -hmm. which I love. And it also has its cousin on there at number 12, How the Grinch Stole Christmas from the year 2000 with Jim Carrey. Very cool. Um, let's see, Elf is on the nice list for some reason. So <laughs> is Die Hard. What is your point? Die Hard <laughs> is a Christmas movie, definitively. It is definitely. That is yes. true. That is true. What number did it come in at? It came in at number 19. 19. It's a good number. Mm -hmm. Right below the third Rudolph that we have on the list, <laughs> which is just Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the movie. There's more than one Rudolph? There's apparently three on here. Oh. I really did not know yeah. that. Nice. Now, how about Nightmare Before Christmas? Did it end up on that, or is it more a Halloween movie? Where, where Nightmare Before Christmas is actually at number 14. And it's nice. also now definitely a Christmas movie. I like and it. I like that one because it's mm -hmm. very versatile. It is. It can be Halloween, it can be 
Christmas. Mm-hmm. I mean, ha- Christmas does start the day after Halloween now, yeah, so. There's no reason. Yeah. Excuse you. <laughs> <laughs> there's no reason to take down your Halloween decorations. Exactly. No reason. Well, then, um, let's move to the naughty list, I guess, um, or the bad list. Again, um, we're going to flash up here a uh, link to a poll, and you can pause the video if you want to play along. Um, and again, go and look at a sampling of our items and vote for what your least liked uh, movie or Christmas special is and uh, see how you compare to the results that we got. All right, the naughty list, which is what you will all be on if you don't use the poll. <laughs> all right, coming in at number one on the naughty list, a Beavis and Butthead Christmas. Why do you <laughs> giggle? <laughs> How can you not? <laughs> no, you did just get to say butthead, so, I mean. My day has been made. Um, I like how you have little notes beside of them. I do. Like, what is, what is that? It's the naughty I list. It's Beavis has got to do some work. Yeah, yeah. he's got to check it. Got to check it twice. Yes. yes. Number two is a Bramble House Christmas, which is a Hallmark movie. Okay, oh. now, be honest. Did you know that, or did you have I, to Google it? I had to Google it, it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not on... The um, elves had to help Santa quite a bit with this. Yes, they did. Did they? Did the elf they put did. all the Hallmark movies on there? <laughs> they did. And did, yeah. did a Christmas prince make it onto that list too down there, elf? Not on the naughty list, but we did study that. We did study the Netflix movies as well as the Hallmark. Yeah. And Bramble House Christmas, along with his other three, are followed by number three, Christmas Evil. Is that also a Hallmark movie? I'm assuming it's also a Hallmark movie. It is not. It is. I do Sounds believe like it belongs. It's a Hallmark <laughs> channel. Oh. Are you sure it's not horror there, Santa? Is there a difference? Uh, fair. <laughs> that is fair. It's, it's all subjective. Um, we also have The Man Who Invented Christmas, which I've never seen. And coming in at number nine, The New Kids on the Block Christmas Special. That one makes me sad. They just don't get the Gen X they representation, don't. do they? They don't. No. Yeah. I think that it's interesting that the man who invented Christmas is on that list. One of the things that was missing from your list I was seeing, I was checking your list with you there, Santa, um, is A Christmas Carol didn't make our top it 20. It did not. Uh, Scrooge makes the top 25, but A Christmas, Car- Christmas Carol doesn't make, yeah. in any iteration, yeah. doesn't make our top 25 or top 30-ish type list. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty interesting. Well, let's look at the songs then. And so, again, uh, we're going to flash up um, on the screen a link to a a poll everywhere for you to vote on um, what you think are the favorite uh, Christmas songs. And again, it's a sampling um, of what we have. And um, Santa's going to give us what's on the list there. All right. So from the list of nice songs, we have number one, You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. It's very autobiographical for me. (laughs) <laughs> I like it. I love that one. So I found it interesting because unlike the other ones, it's not one that you kind of sing along or you hear people singing. You know, carolers aren't going around mm-hmm. singing You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. But I do. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> so I propose. Coming in right behind it is Jingle Bell Rock. It's a classic. Oh, or classic. Or Mean Girls. Or Mean Girls, yes. yes. I forget <laughs> that. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan, she had the dance. We also have some familiar ones like Winter Wonderland at number nine, Joy to the World at number 11, and at number 14, we have Deck the Halls. Mm -hmm. So some classics. Yeah, Yeah. some classics. A lot of classics on this list. But but no Mariah Carey. No Mariah Carey. Or Wham. Or Wham. Mm -hmm. Look at that, you know. We did collect the data for both of those. Mm -hmm. They just didn't make the most liked list. Nope. No. But how much they get played that's surprising. Yeah. Maybe that's right. why they're not on the list. <laughs> probably. Yeah, it's highly possible. Mariah carries Mariah's everyone's like, Mariah, ringtone please. after Halloween to New Year's. Yeah. That's true. Well, let's talk about some other results that we found, Dr. Fugit. Well, the first thing that I'm going to say is, is we're not really talking very much about the songs um, because mostly they weren't statistically significant. Mm-hmm. So before I jump into the results, I am going to give the whole nerd spiel that I like to give that we did do a series of regressions. I did a Bonferroni correction to account for the number of analyses that we did. So we dropped our typical p-value from 0.05 to 0.005 for uh, marginally statistically significant 
and we dropped our um, benchmark to 0.001 for full significance. <clears throat> and mostly the songs were pretty consistent. If people like the songs, they like the songs, and if they don't, they don't. And there's really no components of love or of uh, personality or of religiosity that maps onto them. Now, that's interesting for a couple of reasons. Personality doesn't matter really <laughs> which song that you like. You just like what you like. Mm -hmm. And um, religiosity didn't matter, which is also really interesting because some of the songs, especially um, Silent Night, Joy to the World, mm -hmm. things like that, at least I typically associate with the religious aspect of Christmas, but religiosity wasn't necessarily a predictor for all of those. So we're not really going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about the negative songs either because we think that they maybe were a little bit skewed because there were a couple that we looked up that we didn't know the um, we didn't know the songs based on the names and we hit play and we were like, oh, we know that song. We just didn't know the title of that song or the singer of that song. And so because of that, we were kind of hesitant and with no statistical significance, we just didn't spend a lot of time talking about those. Um, the only one on the most hated, most disliked, how do you say that? Most hated. Naughty list. I'm going to go hate it. Hate it um, yeah. That I found particularly interesting was A Christmas Shoes, which is the one that I can't stand the most. I'm like, I don't know why this song about death is, I don't know. I don't get it. Because you know what's good on Christmas to go with your eggnog. Tears. <laughs> Tears and antidepressants? Yep. Yes. Is that how that works? <laughs> he quarantined to be here. <laughs> Just note. It's worth it. um, it's worth. A couple of other um, big results things that we found were with our top movie specials, TV shows, things like that, is we did, we did see some pretty consistent results. Um, higher levels of being a total fan, the stand that Casey was talking about earlier, was more predictive of liking those top on the list a little bit more. Um, positive levels of pragma, so the more pragmatic, the more reason, duty-bound, practical type of love that you kind of embrace, the more likely you are to endorse liking for those uh, most popular movies and specials and shows. Which kind of makes sense, you know, the Grinch only can destroy Whoville it's within walking distance. I don't know what their car situation actually looks like, or Hallmark movies, things like that. You know, you can only fall in love with the one hot tree farmer that lives in town at a time or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part was that they were also associated with negative levels of Ludo, so lower levels of that playful, uncommitted, flirting type of love were associated with more liking of the more popular shows, which I also find pretty interesting, again, because Pragma and um, Ludos do tend to be the opposite of each other, very practical versus very flirty, that kind of thing. So I thought that was a pretty interesting result. For the bottom, the Ludos, Ludus, depending on how you say it, um, depending on how you spell it, um, d was actually flipped. So we actually saw higher levels of um, Ludos, that playful, uncommitted love for individuals who endorsed higher levels of liking for our movies that were um, more disliked on the naughty list, I guess the way to say it. And that makes a lot of sense, too, when you think about it, because, you know, it takes a different kind of person to like a horror movie for Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's not the typical representation. So, you know, that different kind of things. In terms of personality, we did see more openness and more agreeableness associated with more liking in general. Mm -hmm. That didn't matter if it was top or bottom, just individuals that are more agreeable or more open are more likely to like Christmas things. Um, other things that were interesting is there were a few movies that were associated with religiosity or higher religiosity, more religious, more religiosity, more spirituality, but it was actually much more rare than what we had originally hypothesized. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, A Christmas Story is associated with higher levels of religiosity. Um, I think that has to do with that very traditional aspect of, you know, when the movie is supposed to take place. And that kind of, you know, they don't use the F word, they use fudge instead, that kind of um, time frame. 
other movies. Frosty the Snowman, I think that has something to do with the, you know, you've got to believe in Frosty, you've got to believe in the magic of a hat for Frosty to be real. And so belief is also something that's correlated with religiosity and spirituality. So I can understand those pretty well. There are other ones I cannot understand. Um, a Christmas Evil. Um, <laughs> higher levels of religiosity is associated with... Um, Locking Christmas evil more. Also, negative agreeableness on uh, Christmas evil. Uh, maybe I should check that one out, Dr. Beard. Mm -hmm. Maybe, possibly. Um, a Christmas carol is associated with higher levels of religiosity. Again, it's that kind of redemption factor and things like that, which is really important because I really puzzled over this last one, and I think it was actually Dr. Beard that hit the nail on the head with why, uh, I, I guess. Um, jingle all the way. Is associated with higher <laughs> levels of religiosity and I just I mean I thought is Schwarzenegger like a religious icon now I don't know um, but you said what dr. beard it's redemption I think mm -hmm. you know that goes back with the, the ultimate you know um, lesson from that is you know redemption mm -hmm. we have a lot more results um, we can't present all of them. We don't have enough time, but we have some really cool things. And so mm -hmm. a little bit later on, Dr. Bear will give you some contact information if you want to hit us up and find out more. But we have a lot of other really good movies and shows on the list that has some interesting results. Um, we've got stuff on here like Batman Returns and the Flintstone Christmas Carol, um, Gremlins. So we have some other really good data. It's just they either weren't super significant or we just don't have time to talk about them all today. So let's talk about what do we conclude from all of this, Casey? There's a lot of things to take away, um, particularly that some of the things that are at the top of the list might tell us, the top of the nice list, might tell us some interesting things about what makes Christmas movies or Christmas in general important to us. So we're seeing things like Home Alone, we're seeing um, Christmas Vacation, those are John Hughes films, if I'm correct? Yeah. So those, yeah. maybe John Hughes is a part of what makes Christmas Christmas. For us, um, or even the claymation movies, those were getting <clears throat> top lists. So, you know, those might be really important to us and therefore leave what we like. Um, there's also two, and I feel like I'm bringing this up early, but it's important to say Disney did not ruin this. Disney so, doesn't ruin anything. Let me let me explain. <laughs> so, like, Disney ruins everything. They yeah. have been these these three have been doing studies like this for a really really long time, we're and old. She every said we're old. She every did. time. That they run these studies, Disney skews the results. This is the, one of the first times that it hasn't. Yeah, yeah. Even Disney can't ruin Christmas. Even yeah, Disney that's... can't ruin Christmas. People like love that. Disney, yeah. but they love Christmas even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some other takeaways from this too: the fact that religion doesn't play as much as a role in what you end up liking and what's important to you at Christmas when it comes to media. So I think that's really interesting. Um, along with the fact, too, that you can like whatever songs that you like and hate whatever songs that you hate, and that doesn't really say a lot about you, which is, you know, pretty fascinating. Also, too, lastly, that a lot of the movies that we're seeing at the top of the list are kind of important to people that are, you know, Gen Y. So maybe there's a generational link there, but, you know, that'll lead to Dr. Beard. <laughs> which, which gets into our future directions and what else are we going to look at um, things with this particular study. Um, one thing is generational um, kind of patterns. Uh, we've collected data on that, but we haven't looked at it to see if, you know, certain um, generational X, Y, Z, you know, boomers um, like certain things or don't like certain things more than others. Um, another thing that we want to look at, too, is what we call the dark triad, which is three other personality dimensions, um, including Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy. And so maybe we'll look to see, you know, maybe that has to do something with whether you like the horror movies versus the more Hallmark traditional movies or classics um, and how that might come about. And then another thing that I want to put a little plug in is that um, Dr. Black and Dr. Fugit and I have just completed um, our first book um, on pop culture and psychology um, that we have um, written and it will be out in 2021. So you can go ahead and put it on your Christmas list um, for 2021 um, holiday season. Um, and so uh, our future research will continue to, to look at things to help um, build up that book and our research and, and what else we continue to explore. So um, we also 
are going to flash up here next um, our contact information if you would like to um, get in touch with us have questions about anything just want to talk about pop culture um, or Christmas things um, feel free to do that we also have information about Marshall University which is um, where we teach or where um, the students attend and um, they've been supportive of our research as well as our department and so um, it's a great place Check it out if you're interested um, in pop culture and psychology. Um, and I think that kind of covers it. So we wish everybody a uh, Merry Christmas in July and Happy Holidays um, with whatever you celebrate. And um, I think that'll do it, right? Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. One more thing before you go. We are a family first and foremost, and we know that there are a lot of you who don't have a lot of family that you can share your nerd things with, or your con things with, or even just things things with. And so we're getting ready to have our hashtag con family Christmas dinner, and we would love for you to join us. You have an open seat anytime with any of us we try to be as inclusive and as supportive and as open as we can possibly be. So if you want to join us, we know that right now with everything that's going on, especially that it has to be virtual. So if you do want to join us, if you want to be a part of our family, you're welcome. And we would love to have you. So if you want to post a picture and post it and hashtag it con family Christmas, we will see it, we will find it, we will comment on it, and we can't wait to see what you guys post. Um, we can't wait to have you at our table, and we cannot wait until we can see you at a con. We miss you, and we are just so excited to be able to spend even this amount of time with you. But you always have a place at our table.